Before we get uh, started with the sermon, let me just add a little exclamation point on what Paige shared. Our church is growing, uh, not just here, but across all four campuses. And the fact that we're growing means we have more opportunities and more needs. It's really easy for you to show up here and think, well, they will do it. But if you call Chapel Street Church your home, if you're a visitor or a guest, or I'm not talking to you, but if you're, if this is your church spiritual family, your home, there is no they, there's only we. If you've come here and you've experienced uh, God's blessing, you've been welcomed, you've been impacted by the programs and the ministries of Chapel Street Church, it's because people like you have been serving, and so we need you to do that as well for the, the generation of kids, uh, both in our VBS programs and ongoing. So please, uh, don't just be a spectator or a taker. Be a contributor to the work of God here at Chapel Street Church, and maybe that's, this is your opportunity to do that. And again, we're thankful for those of you who serve so well because uh, it really is not, it's a mistake to think that ministry is done by the professionals. You show up and receive it. It's not true. It's done by the, pe the people of God, which make up the family of God, doing the work of God in this particular place. Uh, yesterday was not just the Kentucky Derby, but across the pond it was, anybody know? Coronation Day. We crowned, a, well, we didn't, but uh, you know, uh, that, that country from which, whence we came, crowned a new king. King Charles, wah, wah, wah. No, yeah. everybody wants King William, but we got a, King Charles for a, like a, as a bridge to get there, apparently. Anybody watch the coronation? Anybody? A few of you? Anybody watch highlights of it? How many of you had no idea this was even happening? Okay, all right, that's fine, fair enough. My wife uh, got up at 4 a.m. or stayed up maybe to watch the coronation uh, live. I watched the recorded version of the coronation service. And I don't know if you saw it or if you've seen any highlights of it, I, I recommend you go and listen to parts of it. It is remarkable. It's in Westminster Abbey, of course, and then the parade from Westminster Abbey to Buckingham Palace. But it's soaked in scripture. The entire uh, service is infused with the gospel. It's covered in images that are about the kingdom of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a lot we can say about uh, mistakes made by an earthly kingdom and an, in, an imperial, you know, the, the empire of Great Britain and so on. Nevertheless, I was struck by the fact that thousands, hundreds there, thousands watching in, uh, you know, in Great Britain and millions around the world hearing the, the word of God read aloud and the gospel proclaimed in this ancient service. You'll see an image here of uh, the king receiving a gift, the Bi a Bible, his, like a royal Bible given to him symbolically, meaning you reign by and under the authority of God's word. Now, I have no idea if he believes any of this or if, if it's just tradition. Nevertheless, the, this imagery is powerful. And, and interestingly, before um, uh, Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, he gave a sermon about the coronation. And in his sermon, he talks about the King of Kings, not King Charles, but King Jesus. And here's what he wrote in part of his sermon. He said, his throne was a cross, his crown made of thorns, his royal regalia, the wounds that pierced his body. And just before he gave this sermon, there was a, a, a passage of scripture read, read by the prime minister of England, of Great Britain, and he, and he is, by the way, a Hindu, who stood up and read a passage out of a New Testament book. Can you guess what it was? It's not a trick question. Yes, it, he read Colossians 1, 15 through 20, which you should all know by heart by now. It was really remarkable. To hear him read these words that we've been studying and committing to memory. Let's stand together and read them aloud, declaring who is indeed the true and only king. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Amen. You may be seated. Eventually, you're going to have to pass the test and recite that. Remember, you know. 
I found myself deeply moved by both the power of those words being read and many others like them and the hymns being sung and the imagery and also then thinking, I wonder how many people know this, really know it, not as a tradition, a national tradition, not as an ancient ritual or rite, but as a personal, present reality. It's one thing to say or recite these words. It's another thing to believe them from a distance. It's yet another thing to say that Jesus is my King, my Lord, and my Savior. So Father in heaven, we live in a world where there are many who claim authority and power. There are many kings and queens. And if we're honest, sometimes we ourselves want to be king or queen over our own life. But now we, we step off the throne and acknowledge that there is only one king of kings, only one worthy of all our praise and worship, only one in whom all things hold together. And so, Lord Jesus, we ask you to speak to us through your word. We pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, we've been working our way through this letter by the Apostle Paul. To a, uh, he wrote from a Roman prison cell to a small little house church in the city of Colossae, modern-day Turkey, ancient Asia Minor, uh, kind of a nothing town, middle of nowhere, a small church. He writes this letter. He's heard about their faith to encourage them. And in the first couple of chapters, he's, uh, well, first chapter in a few verses, I should say, he's focused on what we just read. Who is Jesus? Who is he? is a way of encouraging this little church to hold fast. He's crystal clear, laser focused on who Jesus is. He says, we looked last week, that's his life's mission, to make him fully known, to, that we might grow up fully mature in him. But it's all about who Christ is. And we're gonna see now in chapter two, and then again in chapter three, there's a turn that happens. Paul's gonna shift his focus a bit from who Jesus is to what does that mean? What does who he is mean for us? What does it mean for my life that he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation? And by him all things are created, and in him all things hold together. And then in chapter three, what must I do as a result of that? We'll see. So let's look at verses six and seven of, of Colossians chapter two. Therefore, uh, by the way, uh, some of you that have studied the Bible before, you know this little, this little phrase. Whenever you see this word, what should you do when you see therefore? You should ask a question, and the question is, what is it there for? I know. <laughs> right. But uh, it's important. In light of everything that's come before, in light of all that has just been said about who Jesus is, in light of all that he is, who he is, because of that reality, that transcendent reality of the person and authority and preeminence of Jesus Christ. Therefore, what? As you receive Jesus Christ the Lord, meaning you didn't earn him or achieve him or acquire this, you receive, it's a gift of his grace, you have received that gift and he is now your Lord. Not from a distance like, well, I, I think he may have existed or I believe in God in general, but he's my Lord of my life. Paul says what? So walk in him, rooted and built up in him. You're going to see this phrase, in him, come up a lot. And established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Paul says, okay, therefore, since all we've been talking about who Jesus is, walk in him. Notice he doesn't say walk with him. He says walk in him. Rooted and built up and established abounding in thanksgiving. Walk in him. This idea of being in Christ is crucial. It shows up over and over again because we learned a couple of weeks ago that Christ in you is the hope of glory. Paul will repeatedly talk about what it means to be in Christ and have Christ in us, this union of the believer, the follower of Jesus with Jesus himself. The word walk in Greek is peripateo. It means like conduct your life, walk around, and go this way, in other words. It does not mean walk and conduct yourself so that you earn God's favor. It means you have been rooted, you are being built up, you are established, therefore walk that way. When I was a kid, we used to take vacations on occasion to Sanibel Island, Florida. One time we went over Christmas. 
on my dad's side, the Fraser family. My grandfather had a Fraser fir tree shipped down to Florida for our Christmas celebration. By the way, if you have a fake tree, throw it out, buy a Fraser fir this Christmas. It's the only way to celebrate Christmas, right? Anyway, so in South Island, Fraser fir tree, and my, I can remember vividly, as like an eight-year-old boy, my dad and my grandpa were walking along the beach. You know, when you walk on the, the nice smooth sand where the water washes over, and you can see everybody's footprints clearly before they get washed away by the next wave. And I was trying to keep up with my dad and my grandpa's footprints, because they're like perfect before the wave would come. But I, my legs were too short. So I'm like having to leap, you know, to get my foot in the next footprint to see if I could keep up with them. Match stride for stride. Paul's not saying that you in your own strength much, must match stride for stride with Jesus. You're not capable of that. He's saying something actually much more hopeful and profound to us. He's saying you have been, this is past perfect. You have been rooted in Greek. It's happened to you. You have been rooted in him and you are being built up. You don't root yourself or build yourself up. Jesus has done that and is doing that in you. Like, like when my wife says, hey, those hosta are too big and there's too many daylilies in this area, we must root them up and transplant them somewhere else. They don't transplant themselves. I mean, weeds do that, but the plants you want to grow, you actually have to dig up, right, and take over and dig a new hole and put new soil and plant them somewhere. That's the image. You've been rooted and planted by Christ in him. You didn't do that, he did that. And you are being built up in him. So live that way. Live out of that reality and that identity. In fact, the only two things in this verse that we're commanded to do are walk and thanksgiving. Conduct my life according to that which is already true about me. I'm rooted in Christ. I'm being built up in Christ. And live a thankful life because of who Christ is. Put it to you this way. You have been rooted in Christ. We'll see the next slide there. And you are being built up in Christ so that you may be able to walk in Christ. You have been rooted. You are being built up so that you may walk accordingly. Paul then goes on and describes three incredible truths about what it means to be in Christ. This phrase, in Christ, shows up eight times in the verses we're going to look at, but over and over and over again in all of Paul's letters. You're in Christ. Well, what does that mean? First, being in Christ takes us from emptiness to fullness. Being in Christ takes us from emptiness to fullness. Fullness is a central theme of our series. The tagline is the fullness of God. We're going to see, and we've been saying throughout the series, that all the fullness of God dwells in Jesus, and you who are in him have been filled up in Christ. So you think you lack something? Don't go look at anywhere else other than Jesus, because all that you need and will ever need, you already have in him. He is the fullness of God. He is the way to live a full life. The idea comes up over and over again, as we said. And being filled up in him is what keeps us from being led astray into all the false promises of being filled somewhere else. That is emptiness. Look at verses 8 through 10. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit. According to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled, say it with me, in him who is the head of all rule and authority. There's a lot happening here in these verses. Notice the phrases, captive by philosophy, empty deceit, human tradition, spirits of the world. All of these over against not according to Christ. Paul's saying, what is this, this church is 10 years old. He's writing his letter 10 years after they, they began. And they began by faithfulness to Jesus alone, understanding their only hope is in him. But over time, other ideas have crept in. Other teachings like, yeah, Jesus is good, but you could also use a little human tradition, new philosophies, new ideas. And Paul is essentially saying, no, you don't. To add anything to Christ is to lose him. You already have all that you need in Christ. Don't be taken captive by the empty deceit of the world because you already have the fullness of God in Christ. Be captivated by the fullness of Jesus. 
not taken captive by the ideas. Now, this does not mean, by the way, that when you look out at the world, you come across a, a, an approach to life or a philo philosophy or a worldview that everything outside of the Bible is all evil and bad all the time. No, all truth is God's truth. What it does mean is this. The standard by which we discern truth from error, by which we know what's worth thinking about and following is Jesus. He's the plumb line. He's the objective, universal standard by which we evaluate the ideas of the world. Empty deceit versus filled in him. Let me put it to you this way. Beware of any philosophy or approach to life that does not have Christ at the center, but puts some other teacher, some other idea, some other philosophical presupposition, or frankly, yourself at the center. Even those that sound good. Last week in verse four, we saw that with fine sounding arguments, plausible ideas. Sound, that sounds right, that sounds right, wait a minute. And maybe here's the question we should ask. Does this idea or this philosophy or this worldview elevate Jesus or diminish him? Does it cause me to focus more on who Christ is, to be more devoted to him, or does it sort of come alongside and diminish him in some way? Second, being in Christ takes us from death to life. From death to life. This is the whole heart of the gospel. This, this shows up everywhere in Paul's letters. In Ephesians chapter two, Paul says, you who were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked. And then in verse four of chapter two of Ephesians, Paul says, but God being rich in mercy has made us alive together with him. This is the gospel, friends. If you're like, hey, listen, I'm not a theologian. I'm not a historian. I'm kind of a simple person. Let me give it to you simply. Here's the gospel message. You were dead. Apart from Jesus, you are dead. And God, being rich in mercy, has made you alive. Dead. By the way, this is not Princess Bride version of dead. Like mostly dead, which is also partly alive. Dead meaning dead. Like at the bottom, dead, buried. No hope, helpless, powerless, cannot do anything. But God, being rich in mercy, made you alive in Christ. That's what it means to be in Christ. I, we get this, I think, it, uh, well, let's look at these verses, 11 through 13. There it is again. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. Now, there's nothing quite like reading the word circumcision four times in three verses. Let me try to explain what's happening here. This is an external symbol. In the Old Testament, circumcision was an external symbol of belonging spiritually to God's people. And then Paul compares it, connects it in some ways to baptism. But in this passage, he's not talking about physical circumcision or physical water baptism. He's saying, in Christ, you're already in. You already belong. You need no other external right to make you right. <laughs> you understand? You, you're in. You belong to him. These external things are symbols of the reality you already possess in Christ. That's why he uses the phrase, made without hands. That's what he's getting after here. You were dead, and now you're alive to God in Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ, friends, is not, it's not, a, it's not a life improvement plan. It's not a self-help approach. It's not an add-on to your life. I, one of my great like concerns for us, and I see this in our own church family, I see it online, even people who claim to be followers of Jesus, we treat him as if he's an addition to the life that I'm building. My life, my plan, and of course I want some religion, some spirituality, some of the teachings of Jesus, that will help me. That is not the gospel. Let me say it to you in a way that might shock you and 
Jesus does not want to bless your life. Jesus does not want to improve your life. Because you're dead. What improvement can there be to a dead person? He's not blessed. You're dead. Dead is dead. He wants to resurrect you and give you a life. Not bless your plans for your life. Not improve your agenda for your life. He wants to give you a whole life which you could have in no other way. It's so much better than my measly plans for my life. Or your paltry ideas about what makes the good life. The fullness he offers, and I, I, I barely understand it. The fullness held out to us in Christ is not an improvement on your ideas of what makes your life good. That's nothing. You're already dead. He wants to bring you to life and give you something you could have in no other way. Which makes all of that just look like, why, why would I ever want that? That's what he's saying. I think so many of us in, in contemporary American Christianity think, yes, I, I, sh I should have some, some more religion, some more Christianity, some more Jesus in my life. Because I'm putting together a, a good life. We're building this life. That's a lie. He's not an add-on to your agenda. He's the whole thing. Or he's nothing at all. And that's what he's after. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, he says that we have been buried with Christ in baptism. In order that we're raised with him to walk in newness of life. And by the way, if you're in Christ, that doesn't mean you have it all together, you're perfect, you don't make mistakes. But if you're in Christ, then this is your story. This is who you are. I was dead, and now I'm alive. I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. He just did it. Years ago, I, I visited uh, the Louisiana State Penitentiary. It's uh, nicknamed Angola, Angola Prison in Louisiana. It's nicknamed Angola, by the way. This is not a, it's not a good story. For, uh, because Angola is the part, the region of Africa from which the slaves came that worked those, the plantations on which the prison now is, exists, stands. It's got a dark, ugly history. Uh, it's the largest maximum security prison in our country. People there, the, the laws, most of the men that are in that prison are doing uh, 80 years to life without possibility of parole. While I was there, it, so it, it was known for a while as the bloodiest prison and the, and the deadliest prison and one of the most severe, but also there's this remarkable juxtaposition of the light of the gospel. Many men in that prison come into faith in Christ. I had the chance to visit death row on one of my visits to Angola, walking death row at one of the camps. One of the, there's six different locations, 6,000 inmates. It's a massive series of facilities. Walk the death row row. And I'll tell you, I, there were a couple of moments where I felt the presence of darkness. Like it was palpable, evil. But there were also moments when I felt the clear, unmistakable presence of Christ. Talking with an inmate on death row named Eldon, who is, has since I met him been put to death by lethal injection. But he's with the Lord Jesus. I vividly remember sitting with him and praying with him, and he's condemned to die. No possibility of parole or a commuted sentence. But he was one of the most alive in Christ men I've ever been around. Full of joy, full of hope, full of light, asking how he could pray for me. And he's condemned to die, which, by the way, we all are dead in our sins. But God, being rich in mercy, has made us alive together with him. Last, Paul explains how this works in the next passage. Uh, being in Christ takes us from guilt and shame to grace and victory. So it takes us from uh, guilt and shame to grace and victory, from death to life in the verse, end of verse 13, having forgiven us all our trespasses, then in verse 14, here's how it goes. By the way, these two verses, we could spend 10 sermons on this and not come close. Uh, so I figure we're just gonna, if you don't mind, it's kind of hot outside, we'll just stay with it till like three o'clock. <laughs> There's so, it's just unbelievable. I felt the weight of this. How, Lord, how, how, how are we gonna communicate all that this contains? Listen to what Paul says. 
by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. This is just an incredible couple of verses that were, were given here. He says, canceling the record of debt. Canceling and the record of debt. These two words are two different Greek words. So the record of debt is the Greek word kytographon. It means handwritten, uh, like legal document that puts you in the red according to God. Like you, you're in trouble. You can't pay the debt. There's a handwritten note of a debt you can't pay against you. And we all have one. You've got a record of debt before God. I do. Maybe yours is a post-it note. I don't know. Mine is a phone book, quite frankly. It's a long, ugly record of debt, of sin, that stands against me. And God doesn't wink at it. He doesn't sweep it under the rug. He doesn't pretend it didn't happen. But he does something with it, if you are in Christ. And this is the word canceled. This is a different Greek word. Chirographos. It means uh, uh, wipe away. You've heard the phrase wipe the slate clean or blot out. This is a unique. So in, in the ancient world, paper wasn't like, I like to write my sermons by hand with a fountain pen. I'm kind of a snob on like really nice paper. And the ink actually etches. If you write with ink, it actually etches the paper. You can't wipe it off. You could smear it when it's wet, but eventually it's part of the paper. It's etched in because it's acidic. In the ancient world, paper was either papyrus, which is a reed, or vellum, which is an animal skin. And ink was a natural dye, so it literally sat on the surface of the paper. So with enough effort and wet like a sponge, you could wipe that clean. That's the image Paul is saying. Your record of debt, of sin that stands against you before God, Jesus Christ has wiped away like it was never there. Gone. And only he can do it. Maybe you know the, the, the play Macbeth by Shakespeare. Maybe you studied that in school. Maybe not. Either way, Macbeth is the Scottish noble and he kills the king in his own castle, uh, stabs him, and he's covered in guilt and literally blood on his hand. And his wife, Lady Macbeth, sees the blood on his hand and says, go wash thy hand in the fountain. It'll remove the stain from us because she convinced him to kill the king. And he goes to the fountain and he thinks, can the water of, this, of all the ocean wash me clean? Nay, Neptune's flood could not do it, he says. But my stain of my guilt would turn the whole ocean red. And then that night, Lady Macbeth has this dream where she sees a drop of blood on her own hand, like her own guilt. And this is where she famously says, out, out, vile spot. The whole point is like they can't get clean. They're stained. And Paul is saying, yes, that is true. There is a stain, a record of debt against you and against me, and it's real. But there is one who can and who has wiped it clean, removed it, no stain. That's, the, that's what he's saying when he, this incredible line here. This, he says, he set aside, nailing it to the cross. You know the song, It Is Well With My Soul? You know that the line in that great hymn, my sin Oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part, but the whole, was nailed to the cross. I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. You know that? This is what Paul's saying to this little church that's under persecution. You are clean. You're washed. You, it's, the record against you is removed. You're free. So in other words, in Jesus, we are alive and debt-free. What if you woke up tomorrow and you got online, checked your bank account, and you owed nothing on your mortgage? It was paid. It, if, you, all, if all your credit card was paid off, if your school debts were paid off, if you had 200 grand suddenly in your account, how many of you would be like, that would be sweet? And show of hands, right? <laughs> it seems crazy. Friends, that is nothing compared to what Jesus has done for you. That's nothing. That's earthly riches, which are a vapor. Your debt, which is unpayable on human terms, is canceled in Christ. And then, if, as, if, as if that weren't enough. So it, it could end there with just to the cross, boom, and awesome. 
My, this, verse 15 is just incredible. Here's what he says. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Ah, oh, there it is again, in him. So let's talk about this. Disarmed, it's the, it's the same Greek word means to, like, to strip the weapons away from an enemy or to defang an animal, a wild animal. I had a friend who had a, a, grew up on a pig farm and we would detusk the boars. Well, I didn't, I watched them do it. But then the boars, were, they would squeal a lot and kinda, but they weren't scary anymore because they had no tusks. In other words, Satan, the great enemy, is a toothless tiger because of Jesus. His, his defeat was secured at the cross. Your shame, your guilt, those things that you think stand against you, which disqualify you, which make you think you're not worthy, Jesus has triumphed over them. He's put them to open shame. And this word triumph, this is a single, single Greek word, which literally meant triumph, like a, it's a, a, the best way to describe it is a victory parade. A Roman general who had conquered a city or a people, the Senate could, if they chose to, give that general a triumph, meaning a, a multi-day celebration of their great victory. And you can read about this in Plutarch's uh, histories and so on. There's stories of the triumph. And it was, here's how it went. The whole parade was orchestrated to demonstrate that the power of Rome had conquered the fear of this enemy. And to put that enemy to shame, to humiliate them. And they would parade in slaves that were taken captive. Huge wagons full of all the armor and weapons of the enemy. All polished to look impressive, but now we own it. It's ours. Taken away. Disarmed. Then would come paintings, murals made by Roman artists of the land that they had conquered. Then would come the spoils of war, all the symbols of that city or that, that people's authority and power, which now was owned by Rome, paraded in. In fact, you'll see an image here on the screen. This is a relief on the Ark of Titus, uh, the great general who, along with Vespasian, conquered Jerusalem in 70 AD. And you see what this is a picture on that a relief carving on that great ark. Uh, uh, which arch, which has, uh, what are they carrying here? Can you see it? Parading through the, the streets of Rome. The menorah, the seven candle uh, symbol of the Jewish people. Because they'd conquered them. Here's the arch, arch itself, which becomes the model for the Arch of Triumph in, in Paris. But this is Titus's arch. Given this triumph, paraded through the city. Here's what, so Paul is clearly subverting the Roman idea of power. Rome conquers by military power and might. How does Jesus conquer? By love and by giving himself at the cross. And all those things which are our shame and our guilt and we fear are now paraded. He put our shame to shame. You don't have to fear your past. You don't have to live in shame over what you did or what's done to you. You don't have to live in fear of the future because all that's been conquered, all that's been defeated put to open shame by triumphing over them in him, he says. Why? So that you and I might walk in him. Walk in this freedom and in this reality. We sang a moment ago, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. That's what Paul's saying. No guilt in life, no fear in death. He's triumphed. His victory is my victory. His triumph is mine because I'm in him and he's in you. So let's look again at these verses from Colossians chapter two once more. And you who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. This is exactly what we celebrate when we come to the table of the Lord. This is what it means, the victory of Jesus at the cross in the empty tomb. We come to his table and remember through this, the, uh, the symbols of bread and cup what he's done, what that sacrifice means. It's, it's our triumph 
our victory, our joy, and our salvation. So if you have your, your cup, let's pull that out together. And I, I just want to give you a moment. Before we take the bread, I want to give you a moment of silence right where you sit to speak to the Lord and let him speak to you. Perhaps you are carrying some shame or some guilt that you think disqualifies you. But I will remind you that if you are in him, he has canceled that record. He has removed it and nailed it to the cross. Jesus, he has triumphed over that. Let's peel off that bottom layer and take the bread in our hands. And I remind you of the words of the Lord Jesus who said that he is the bread of life and that this is his body and it is given for you. Eat this in his memory. The scripture says that after they'd eaten together, Jesus poured out a cup. So this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And that every time we as his followers eat the bread and drink the cup, we are proclaiming the victory of his death and resurrection. Let's do that together. Amen. Brothers and sisters, come now in the grace and power of him who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And in him, all things hold together. And by him, we have life and hope of salvation and forgiveness. To him be glory and honor now and forever. Amen. And go in peace.